It's David Wowie. How do you build the ultimate team in another Eden? What should you be thinking about when facing a challenging boss? I'll show you my personal approach to building the greatest team on the planet. And to prove this stuff works, I'll show you how I beat three of some of the toughest bosses out at the moment using this exact method. There are plenty of awesome players in this community, so if you have your own tips, share them below. Or if you have questions, ask them as I'm sure someone will be happy to help. Don't forget to like and subscribe to help more people find out about this great game. And if you're feeling generous, donate a thanks or become a super member. Before we get into the good stuff, I like to start with setting the right foundations. To me, there are two main types of teams you can build. One team for grinding through dungeons and leveling up, the other for fighting super bosses, which is probably why you're watching this video right now. But first, let's look at the team you need for grinding through dungeons as realistically, that's probably the team you'll be using the most often in this game. This is the easiest kind of team to build. If you're grinding through easy to medium difficulty dungeons, I like to create a team with one max level mob clearing power hitter who uses little to zero MP and then fill the rest of the team up with characters who you want to level up. That way I'm clearing through dungeons as quickly as possible while at the same time leveling up five other characters. And if you're leveling up your manifest weapons, equip those characters with those weapons. Just in case you didn't know, Characters can actually carry and level up manifest weapons that aren't theirs as long as it's the right weapon type. So a katana user like Tsukiha for example can use and level up Melissa's manifest weapon Singularity. On top of that I would also add sidekicks that aren't max level yet both for main story part 1 and 2 and throughout a lot of the extra episodes, symphonies, side chapters and dungeons for the most part you can use a maxed out level 80 version of one of my favorite characters for Melopus as the main attack character. Use her 0 MP cost skill Huli Trechu to clear mobs and quickly smash through every dungeon and when you finally reach a boss just use the skill Neptune to make beating bosses a bit easier. Equip for Melopus with pain, poison or water based elemental grasta. Some and other dungeons require to have a certain number of total light or shadow points to get the maximum rewards. So you can also add characters in there that have a higher number of light or shadow points. For light and shadow point farming tips, check out the guide I made. If you're new to the game, a more modern character you could use instead of Flamelpus would be a Stellar Awakened Thililia Extra Style. If you've unlocked a Stellar Skill, Sword of Heart, it gives a Crystal Slash attack on all enemies and gives Barry Pierce and it costs 0 MP. There are a number of other characters that are like this too. For current main content and for more challenging stuff with phase shifts, you need a stronger team. Luckily with Stellar Awakening, it takes much longer for strong teams to reach max level 100. So even if you got a strong team, you can still feel like you're being productive in leveling them up because there's a high chance that your strong Stellar Awakened team isn't max level yet. Here's a sample team I've got that I use to grind dungeons. I've got three heavy hitters, Melissa, Tukiha and Suzette, who I can use to beat mobs, horrors and a lot of bosses. And at the same time, I've got a healer and support unit, Melpifia. One good thing about Melpifia is that she has a stellar awakened skill that allows the first move in battle to cost zero MP. She can also restore everyone's HP and MP at the end of every turn. Check out my guide for more info. If you don't have her, some other things you can do to regenerate MP is use the sidekick Kumos. There are also a lot of modern characters who can regen MP like Mune for Alter and Alma Another Style or like Thilly Lily Extra Style have skills that cost 0 MP. But this isn't the fun stuff. What you're probably more keen on is building a crazy team that can beat super bosses. When building a team, I like to start with good foundations. Once again, if you have your own tips, share them in the comments. But for me, I like to start with a team that has first a pain or poison setup. Why a pain and poison setter? If you watch YouTubers easily beating super bosses with the same team you have, but for some reason you can't beat those bosses yourself, one main reason is that because that YouTuber probably has good pain or poison grass equipped. And the only way for pain or poison grass to be effective is if the enemy has pain or poison on them. That's why a pain or poison setter is important. More on this soon. Next, I like to have a tank unit then 
a support unit, and then finally, a strong attacker. So a really basic example would be for a pain setter, I'd have Ify who can use the skill Rosa Liliac to cause pain and poison. For a tank unit, I could use someone like Radius, another style, who can defend the team against strong attacks with a skill Chivalry. For support, I could use Mion for Alter, who can make my main attack character really strong, and then an attack unit like Yakumo. I'll get into reserves soon, but just so you know this setup works, here's an example of this team in action beating the Ukwaji clan. Also, I'll show you how the strategy can work to beat the strongest bosses in the game soon. Of course, you'll get characters and sidekicks that can fill the role of a lot of these and there will be an overlap. For example, Suzette can be a pain and poison setter and a main attack unit. Malpifia and Mario ES can be a support unit and a tank. The defense version of the sidekick Iridian can give everyone a decent barrier. I'll get into sidekick soon. So. If you have double ups, just tweak your team as necessary or just tweak the skills you use. Let's say you have Suzette as a pain and poison setter. So you no longer need to use Ify's Rosa Liliac skill to set pain and poison, but you still need Ify to revive characters from being knocked out. Ify also has a bunch of other skills like Nocturnal Procession that can buff up your team, so she could still be useful. Or let's say you have Melpithia, who can be a tank and support unit. Since she takes up two roles, you can swap the role you would have assigned for a tank unit for someone else who could benefit your team. If you want to deal more damage, maybe you could add in another attack unit like Melissa. Now let's talk about reserves. The most obvious reason to have reserves is to have backups in your team just in case someone gets knocked out. For example, the super boss Icefield's master randomly knocks characters out. When I fought against it, I had Mariel AS in the reserves as she was another character I could use that could resurrect other characters back from the dead. I'll show you a video of this soon, but that's not the main reason I use reserves. Another reason you may choose someone in the reserves is so you can bring them to the front line to activate a Valor Chant. A Valor Chant is basically a skill that a unit activates when they move from the reserves to the front line. For example, if you look at Kid's Valor Chant, she'll increase the physical and wind type resistance of all party members when she moves to the front. And some characters release a zone when moving to the front line. Milpifia, for example, deploys Wind King Stance. You may also want to think about unique characters who can benefit other characters in the front line. Ukuji, who's a free character, can actually auto heal your characters as it sits quietly in the reserves. But that's not all. The main reason I actually use reserves is to use them as grasser holders for your characters in the front line. What does this mean? Here, my main attacker in the front line for this team was serious. A few hundred million damage per hit wasn't good enough for me, man. I got a bit greedy and wanted him to reach the damage cap of 2.14 something billion by turn two, plus some, and for some reason just couldn't do it. That's when I used one of the characters in the reserves to be a Grasta Holder. Since characters have a limited number of Grasta slots, you can actually equip characters with shareable Grasta that benefit one or more characters in the team. So you might as well make your reserves useful by equipping them with shareable Grasta. There's a whole list of shareable Grasta you can find in the unofficial wiki, which I've linked in my description. Remember, you need to upgrade these grasser with upgrade ores before they become shareable. The shared grasser I use the most are the Enhancive Max HP grasser, which increases the damage of anyone else with the same weapon type as the grasser holder. In this case, I equipped CL another style, who's in the reserves, with the Enhance if Max HP brackets bow grasser as he's a bow user like Sarius. There's also the power of whatever element that grasser is about that increases element type attack of everyone in the team with similar elements and weapon types. So here I gave Ciel another style with the power of Quake brackets bow to further strengthen Ciel as Ciel and Sarius are both earth bow users. I didn't have the right grasser for this example, but there are also almighty power, brackets, insert the personality here, that increases the damage of everyone in the team who has the same personality as the grasser holder. For example, in my Melissa guide, I gave Shannon Alter the almighty power brackets KMS grasser as both she and Melissa have KMS in their personalities. Where can you find these grasser? Multiple locations. Refer to the link to the unofficial wiki grasser page 
in the description of this video. Speaking of Grasta, we've talked about the best Grasta for reserve members, but what Grasta should you give your main team? Grasta can be super important for your team and could mean the difference between losing, winning, and winning by insane amounts of damage. And let's face it, it's always satisfying to win by insane amounts of damage. Talking about grass that will take up an entire video, luckily I've already done one for you, check it out after this. Just know that there are numerous kinds of grass and the list is always growing man. Oh, I just burped. Oh, I drank too much water. Once again, check my link to the unofficial wiki where you can see the most up-to-date grasser. As of now, my favorite type of grasser for attack teams are pain grasser, which I talk about in the guide. As I mentioned earlier, when you see people on YouTube absolutely obliterating super bosses, it's usually because they have different types of pain grass equipped. It's also important to think about what grass ores you upgrade your grass with. The ores I like to upgrade pain grass with are insult to injury ores, last stand ores, bull's eye ores, and rose with thorns ores. The guide will tell you more about these ores. I don't often use Grasta for my support units, so if you're a pro at support Grasta, share some good ones in the comments. My current go-to Grasta for my support characters like Melpithia and Mion for Alter are the Boost Proficiency Grasta, which improves the effectiveness of their buffs, and the Proficiency Debuff Resistance Grasta, which is useful against super bosses that try to lower your stats with debuffs. What this Grasta does is it weakens those debuffs, giving you an advantage in battle. Also, don't forget about Grasa that can activate zones and revive characters. Sometimes, for example, you'd have a main fire attacker like Cellar Awake and Tsuka in your team, but no one else in your team can set a raging fire stance to make Tsuka's fire attacks even stronger. So what you can do is you can give someone in your team the spell Raging Fire Grasa, which gives the Grasa holder a skill that allows them to set raging fire stance. Here's the current list of zone setting grass that you can get. Once again, this is often updated. Curse of Revival is another fantastic grass that where you can revive a teammate from being knocked out. I use this in my fight against Ice Fields Master, which you'll see soon. How about sidekicks? I choose my sidekicks based on the foundations I mentioned earlier, where a great team has a pain setter, a tank, a support unit, and an attack unit. I pick my sidekick depending on whether my team is lacking in any of the skills presented by these types of units, or if I need to weaken the enemy so my attacks become stronger. For example, if you need a sidekick that inflicts pain, there's actually an item you can equip your sidekick with called Bleeding Edge that gives the chance of inflicting pain. Or if you equip the attack version of Iridian with Dragon Exile's Dole, it inflicts pain on all enemies. If you need a tank, sidekick the defense version of iridian gives a barrier to your entire team and it attacks enemies with a water blunt attack if you want to buff up your sword katana or axe characters ilul alter sidekick limel does just that if you need a healer tetra heals and cure statuses at the end of each term and when at the right charge can bring everyone back from being knocked out which is the main reason why i put him in my team against Icefield's master who knocks out random team members like a douche. As you play the game longer and collect more characters, you can create teams based on one element. Like with me for example, I have a water team, an earth team and so forth, just in case I have to fight a boss of one particular element. And I'll show you a real example of this soon. In saying that, there are also characters who chop and change in elements. For example, Dewey alters attacks change element to the current zone. You can also look out for characters with a skill Link, Kaleido and Flexible. Link gives an additional elemental effect after every move. For example, Tuva Extra Style's move Paladin Queen gives Link to all party members and they inflict a shade type attack after every move. Kaleido changes the elemental type of party members. Melpithia, who I did a guide on, if Win King stance is activated and when four Arcadia members are on the front line, she changes everyone's element to wind. In fact, most, if not all, they haven't released all the Arcadia members yet at the time of this video, can change the team's elements to their own unique element. Where Kaleido changes element type, Flexible changes attack type. Claude Extra Style, who I did a guide on, has a skill called Strata Nike, which changes his attack type to the character he placed Empathy on. How about weapons and armor? 
When creating the most powerful team on earth, you'd want the best equipment and armor. I'm a super impatient person, so I just usually pick whatever's at the top of the list in the unofficial wiki. But if you have the patience, there's a lot more that goes into it. You want different kinds of equipment for different purposes. Let's say you have a Thunder team. One main feature of Thunder teams is their ability to deal lots of attack within another force. To inflict as many attacks in another force as possible, you need more speed. Therefore, you need to equip your team with items that increase your speed, not necessarily power. This is where it's useful to study the weapons and equipment in the unofficial wiki, which I've linked to in this video. When we're looking for speed, sure, Dryad's weapons, which are the latest ultimate weapons available, could be good, but so can the Lunar items. Or if you have a character like Yifa Nova Style, who is a support character who improves the more spirit she has, you want a weapon that gives more spirit. Attack power isn't that important for someone like her. A fully maxed out, time restored hammer will help with this. Also, in some cases, the features of a weapon make it more important than its attack power or how new it is. For example, in some cases, the Elpis weapons can be better than the Dryad's weapons even if the Dryad's weapons are newer in the game. This is because the Elpis weapons have the overthrow ability, which increases in strength the higher the level your enemy is. Shout out to Best Boy for making me aware of this. The same goes with badges. Use the badges that are most appropriate for battle. Some of my favorite badges are the Bullseye Badge, which increases everyone's damage outside of another force, the Stats Plus Badges, which increases your character's stats, and the Falcon Badge, which lets you land the first attack in battle. This could also be useful for a support character who wants to quickly add a buff on one or more characters before they have a chance of attacking. You can also think about badges that are most suitable for your character. Yifa another style, who I mentioned just then and who I also did an in-depth guide on, is better when she has more spirit, so you may want to give her a spirit plus badge. The Astral Archives also have character-specific tomes that when you complete them, reward you with badges that can be useful and are usually specifically designed to benefit the characters. For example, be it Garyu's ally Astral Archive tome, and you get the Flame Lord Badge, which increases intelligence by 30 and decreases MP costs. These are the basics. Before we get to the juicy part, let's do a recap. An amazing team could typically include a pain setter, a tank unit, a support unit, and a strong attacker. One of the most important parts of the team setup is which skills you use and the order you use them. Once again, the skills you use will depend on the enemy you're facing, but the general rules I like to use in a lot of battles. I like the battle to be over as quickly as possible, which means I want to strengthen my team and weaken the enemy as quickly as possible. To do this, I often like to apply all the buff and debuff skills during another force on turn one. In this example, I activate all the buffs I need to turn Melissa into a multi-billion damage dealing machine from the get-go. I plan the skills I want to use for each character ahead of time and order them according to the turn in battle. So in this example of Melissa, I have a turn 1 setup move in skill slot 1, a turn 2 move in skill slot 2, and the move I want to spam the most during another force, usually her strongest attack move in skill slot 3. I use the same approach for every other character in my team. My turn 1 moves in skill slot 1, turn 2 in slot 2, turn 3 in slot 3, and so forth. And when it's a long battle, and since a lot of skill effects just last for 3 turns, I just repeat skill 1 in slot 1 for turn 4, skill 2 in slot 2 for turn 5, and skill 3 in slot 3 for turn 6, and so forth. Obviously there are exceptions, and sometimes you'd have to change the skills around, but I use this as a general guide and work from there. Before I show you the teams I use to beat super bosses, as a summary, I start from the following foundations and adjust accordingly. In my teams, I usually have a pain setter, a tank, a support character, and a strong attacker. You can include backup characters in the reserves, and you can also use the reserves as grasper holders to make your frontline characters even stronger. Do I use this exact formula every single time? Definitely not, but it's a good starting point in making the world's greatest team. 
Now here's the theory in action. Let's look at these three super boss battles. Of course there are people online who have beaten the following bosses much quicker than I have, but hopefully these videos will still help. Now let's look at my fight against Wetland's master. Here I use Ify as my pain setter, Mune for Alter as my support character, and Stellar Awake and Tsukiyo as my attack character. If you want some tips about using a Stellar Awake in Tukiha, check out my Suzette vs Tukiha guide. Because if he has a debuff that greatly reduces the strength of the enemy, I didn't need a specific tank unit in this team. You'll see in this fight that sometimes the boss will deal zero damage. Instead I got another support character, Tsukiha Alter, whose job was to set raging fire stance and reduce the enemy's resistance against fire attacks, and at the same time making Stellar Awake in Tukiha stronger. In the reserves I had Kid as my Grasta holder and I didn't really have a reason for putting Rise in the back. If I really wanted to ace this fight, I probably could have had another Grasta holder there. I pretty much repeated the same order of moves again and again with some slight variations. You can pause to see the exact skills I used but overall the goal was to weaken the enemy and strengthen Tsukiha and to make sure to use Tsukiha's stellar burst when I could. Rinse and repeat baby! Power. The power. Come <laughs> on. 
Here is the equipment and grass that I used. I actually forgot to record the equipment I used after this fight. So this is just my guess as to what I used, but I think it's close to what I had. This is my fight against the Dawn Tower Master. It's an example of how we need to study an enemy's weakness and form a team that can exploit those weaknesses. The Dawn Tower Master seems to absorb every element except for water, so I had to build a water team to go against that. In this case, Ilulu Alto was both my pain setter and attacker. El Seal was my support unit. For tips on her skill set, check my guide on her. Dunroth Alter was both a tank and support unit, and his mana Alter was my added attack unit. And I had Shani and Philo in the reserves to be my Grasta holders to strengthen my attack characters, his mana Alter and Iluru Alter. As you can see, I used another force right away to buff everyone up and weaken the enemy as quickly as possible. I used the sidekick Tetra to be my healer, and later in the fight you'll see I used Tetra to revive Dunroth Alter from being knocked out. I also switched to using the sidekick Kumos to restore everyone's MP once it starts running out. And like I mentioned in the skill section earlier, I pretty much use the same skills on repeat with minor variations throughout. Feel free to pause throughout this fight to see the skills I used in detail.
Here are my grasser and equipment, which is very similar to the grasser and equipment setup I talked about earlier. Finally, let's use my team building strategy to fight one of the toughest bosses at the moment, Ice Fields Master. My pain setter was iffy, my support units were Mune for Alter and Stellar Awakened Melpithia, who also served as a tank unit, and my attacker was Sarius. What makes Ice Fields Master unique is that it randomly knocks out characters, so rather than have Graster holders in the reserves, I had backup characters. Mariel AS was there because she has a revive skill to bring back characters from the dead and Stellar Awakened Tsukiha was there to replace Sarius if he got knocked out. If he can also revive knocked out characters and I gave Melpithia the curse of revival grass that I mentioned earlier as he can bring back characters to life. I've done full guides on Ify, Sarius and Melpithia so check them out to better understand why I chose their skills in this battle. I also use Tetra as a sidekick as he can also bring back characters to life. If you've noticed, in each of these boss battles, I pretty much used a very similar formula each time. I studied the enemy, then I created a team that has a pain setter, a tank unit, a support, and a main character. Then I tweaked the setup to best suit the fight I'm getting into. It's as simple and as challenging as that, baby.
Into power.
Ancient power. I'll save you with my healing blade. Closer to the divine? Here's my grassland equipment setup for the Ice Fields Master. What are your strategies? Let me know below.